It's like the beginning of a horror novel by Stephen King. But this is real. Stalked by a madman in the night, a young man plays possum. He's disoriented. In the darkness, he runs for his life. He's afraid of what might be coming after him. He stumbles onto a busy highway. He's frantic. He wants the driver to call the police. It may already be too late. He's got two friends back there, and the guy who attacked him is going to kill them. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there somewhere in the first 72 hours. Manitoba, 1993. In a police car on a rural highway, a young man named Jason pleads for help. His friends, Lori and Jenna, are in danger. They might even be dead. Police take him seriously, but they need to hear the whole story from the beginning. Jason says earlier that evening, he and some friends had driven out of the city to party in the woods. He tells police the party started out great. Some weed, some laughs, a lot of beer. Eventually, nature called. Buddy Stanley followed him. They shared a joke. But then, lights out. When Jason came to, he was hogtied on the ground. He had no idea why Stanley did this to him. And he's terrified for his friends, Lori and Jenna. Jason's story convinces police to mount a search. Officers ask Jason for directions, but his head injury has made his memory fuzzy. The search goes on all night and into the morning. Stanley Pomfret, 31, is held pending multiple charges. The case is assigned to Detective Harvey McLeod. Certainly these young victims uh, went through something very horrific in the back of that vehicle. But to charge Stanley Pomfret, the detective needs detailed and consistent statements from the victims. All three streetwise teenagers live in foster care in the same Winnipeg neighborhood. Now I want to ask you a few questions. The detective is concerned that Lori and Jenna may be unwilling to talk about their experience. He asks the girls to take it one moment at a time. Lori says everything was cool at the party until Jason and Stanley went off somewhere. They were gone a long time. Jason? Jenna got worried. She went to find them. Lori says she waited. It seemed like forever.
Lori and Jenna don't want to relive what comes next. Mr. Pomfret subdues these young girls in the back of the vehicle by uh, tying them up into various positions. Uh, during this time frame, uh, various uh, sexual acts were performed on these young females by Mr. Pomfret, uh, of which he recorded them uh, via video camera and Polaroid film. Jenna says Pomfret told her, if you scream, I'll cut out your tongue and leave you to die in the woods. McLeod has heard enough. The girl's statement suggests to Detective McLeod that Stanley Pomfret planned the attacks well in advance. This crime scene was located in a, uh, a dense wooded area uh, between the east and westbound lanes of the number one highway. Now, can you imagine any, why anybody in the right mind other than what Pomfret had in his mind, would want to come here. I mean, secrecy, he, he was guaranteed secrecy. Nobody would ever venture into this area. Why would you? I mean, you can hear the traffic on the east side of the highway and on the west side of the highway. Uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, he had this well planned. In this secluded location, the detective notices that trees have been cut to make a hiding place for Pomfret's pickup truck. In the back of the truck, investigators discover a duffel bag containing Polaroid photographs of Lori and Jenna, and plastic bags of what appears to be pubic hair. Also, some earrings. Which, to our mind, looked like they had been forcefully removed from a person's earlobe. Uh, there was blood on the one of the earrings and also on one of the studs to uh, keep the earring in place. Pending forensic analysis, Detective McLeod has all he needs to prosecute Stanley Pomfret for multiple premeditated sexual assaults. But as investigators prepare to leave the crime scene, a police dog finds something else. A human skull. A second crime scene? Forensic investigators have discovered a human skull just a few feet away from the scene of a violent sexual assault. The original crime scene, of which we have been notified about, had now yielded another crime scene of much greater magnitude. Who died here? How they died is unknown. We assume that it was foul play, uh, as we do in all of these matters, and we treated it as a homicide. Scattered over a large area, police find more human bones. We notice that the uh, bones uh, uh, were devoid of any flesh or, or skin or uh, muscle material. Uh, uh, they were just uh, stripped clean. The detective knows why. Obviously, the body had been laying there for some time and had been ravaged by wild animals. There was a lot of uh, bear scrapes on the tree, a lot of bear markings, uh, hair, and uh, this was the original originating point of, uh, of their meal right here. Aside from the human bones, the search yields nothing except some red paint chips. And then, a torn woman's shirt, an attack by bears, or a more sinister human predator. Detective McLeod sends the shirt to forensic textile expert Bill Pelton for analysis. I scan the fiber and yarn ends along the severance line. The fibers were all ending at the same plane, indicating that they were cut. And this meant that it had to be human intervention that can cause the damage and not an animal. The shirt has been deliberately cut. This confirms McLeod's suspicion of foul play, and so does the coroner's report on the cause of death. There were fracture marks in her skull that radiated from her left eye socket and above her left ear, uh, which indicated that she had been struck with a blunt instrument. 
Uh, her teeth displayed pink teeth syndrome, uh, which was indicative of uh, strangulation. Based on other bones found at the crime scene, the report concludes that the victim was a female between the ages of 15 and 17. In this one location, the murder of a young woman and a violent sexual assault. The two crimes could be completely unrelated, but Detective McLeod doesn't believe in coincidences. He confronts Stanley Pomfret with the ripped shirt found at the murder scene. He tells Pomfret that if he knows anything about the dead woman, now would be the best time to talk. Pomfret doesn't. The detective will have to solve this murder the hard way, working backwards from the time of death. Mother Nature provides the first clue. The next day, uh, we collected uh, various uh, samples of uh, larvae, pupae, and bugs that were in the area where the corpse had been deposited. And we sent them to Dr. Gail Anderson, uh, who's an entomologist at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Insects are pretty much the first witnesses to the crime. They'll arrive very quickly after death, and they lay their eggs on that body. Eggs hatch into maggots, pupate, and emerge as adult flies, living on the body for their entire life cycle. I had maggots, but I also had empty pupil cases, and those are the most important part of the evidence to me. Several pupae cases are in varying degrees of decomposition, indicating a precise number of days since death. My report to the lead investigators in this case was that death had occurred on or before the 5th of June. The murder took place just six weeks ago. Detective McLeod searches missing persons records. Reports from the beginning of June include one teenaged girl. The detective contacts forensic odontologist, Dr. Chris Lavelle. The RCMP brought me a skull and a lower jaw wrapped in separate bags and two dental x-rays of, of a child that they thought uh, was the victim. And I was then able to put them on a light tray for computer analysis and measure these teeth and the teeth outlines very carefully looking at the positions of the tooth cusps and was able to confirm at least eight cardinal statistical similarities between the two. Now the murder victim has a name, Tanya Marshall, a girl who grew up in foster care in the same neighborhood as Jason, Lori, and Jenna. They tell McLeod they know Tanya, but haven't seen her in a few weeks. They are shocked to hear she's been murdered. The uh, lifestyle of the two young females who have been sexually assaulted and the lifestyle of the young female who had been murdered uh, were identical. Uh, they knew the same people. Uh, they frequented the same areas. Uh, they went into the same establishments. The detective asks if Tanya had a boyfriend or a would-be boyfriend. Lori says she never talked about anyone. Tanya liked people to think she was tough. She was in foster care because her mother couldn't handle her. But the last time Lori saw Tanya, she was in a great mood. She'd met up with her mother and was planning to move back home for good. Lori and Jason have no idea who might have wanted to kill her. One young man remembers seeing Tanya on the day she disappeared heading out of town in a red van. The detective wants to know if he saw who was driving. Sure, says the kid. Some guy named Stanley. In an interview room, Detective McLeod tells Pomfret he has an eyewitness who can put him with Tanya Marshall in a red van on the day she died. Pomfret isn't impressed. He admits he knew Tanya. He admits she was with him that day. But they weren't heading out of town. 
he was giving her a lift back home. They said a friendly goodbye, and that was the last time he saw her. The detective has sufficient evidence to convict Pomfret for the sexual assault of Lori and Jenna. But without a conviction for Tanya's murder, Pomfret will be out in three to five years. And he knows it. Detective McLeod lacks hard physical evidence to connect Stanley Pomfret to the murder of Tanya Marshall. He obtains a search warrant for Pomfret's property. Hidden under a tarp, the detective discovers Pomfret's other vehicle, a red van. Scrapings of its paint are sent for analysis to see whether they match the paint chips found in the woods. Investigators enter Pomfret's house and take it apart. We uncovered some pornographic literature and uh, pornographic films. The pornographic literature uh, showed instances where women were in bondage with various devices and also depicted the cutting of women with razor blades. It would give us a picture that uh, Mr. Pomfret was uh, of the uh, sexual status type of individual. Inside Pomfret's tackle box, an investigator discovers a medicine bottle with Tanya's name on it. The prescription pills were written for a 30-day period, and we examined the amount of pills in the bottle and extrapolated back as to when the, uh, the pills were issued to her. Uh, the last day that she would have taken a pill would have been on June the 5th, the day she disappeared. But Tanya could have left her pills in Pomfret's van the day he said he dropped her off. The next day, McLeod receives the forensic report on the paint scrapings from the red van. They are a perfect match with the paint chips found in the woods. Which proved to us that he had been at this uh, area several times in different vehicles. And this wasn't a haphazard area that he just drove to. But even this discovery doesn't prove that he drove Tanya here the day she disappeared. And then, a cloud receives some astonishing news. We had a DNA analysis done of the uh, blood on the earrings that we found in Pomfret's truck. The blue pickup truck where Pomfret assaulted Lori and Jenna. The blood on the earrings did not belong to either of the girls. It matched the DNA of Tanya Marshall. For Detective McLeod, the two separate crimes have just become one investigation. To prove Tanya's murder, the detective reviews the evidence of the assaults on the three other teenagers. The similarities are uncanny. And the common denominator uh, from all of this was Stanley Pomfret. McLeod now has a clearer picture of Pomfret and how he operated with the foster kids. He was like their cool older brother. He would buy them drugs, beer. He had wheels to get them out of town. They liked him because he was one of them, from a broken family with a long history of abuse. Pomfret is Jekyll and Hyde, and no one, including Tanya, ever noticed. Pomfret would, uh, in my opinion, uh, prey on these young girls uh, to lure them into his confidence, uh, to make him seem that uh, he's Mr. Nice Guy. McLeod is sure that six weeks earlier, he used the same ploy on Tanya to get her into the woods. McLeod reconstructs what must have happened to Tanya Marshall based on Jenna, Lori, and Jason's accounts of what happened to them. It's an unusual way to argue a case, but for McLeod, it's the best he has. Pomfret clubbed Jason with a baseball bat, strangled him, hog-tied him, and left him to die. During the sexual assault of Jenna and Lori, Pomfret tied up the girls, 
cut their clothes off, assaulted them, and took some pubic hair as a trophy. Tanya's case is disturbingly similar. Like Lori and Jenna, Tanya's shirt was cut. Knots found in the shirt indicate it was used to tie her up. McLeod presumes that Pomfret sexually assaulted Tanya. When he was done, he strangled her, as he did to Jason, and then finished her off with a blow to the head. And finally, according to McLeod, Pomfret took a trophy, this time a pair of earrings. Each of these pieces of evidence by themselves uh, did not have any weight. But when you put them together globally, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that's totally unfolding before you, and all the pieces are now there. As McLeod completes the puzzle for the murder of Tanya Marshall, he comes to a chilling conclusion about the assaults of Lori, Jenna, and Jason. It certainly is to everyone's benefit that the young lad escaped his bonds, flagged down a car on the number one highway, and was able to raise the alarm. Uh, if he didn't do that, then certainly all three of these individuals would be dead today. The court agrees with Detective McLeod and sentences Stanley Pomfret to four life terms, one for each of his victims. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real.